The Johns often talk about bringing the right attitude to the meditation. The Johns Sawat would talk about bringing an attitude of confidence. Glad that you're here. Inspired by the fact that you have time to focus on your mind. and do some inner work that's not involved with the, the drudgery of the work of the world. We can lift your mind above its ordinary concerns. And John Lee, when he talks about settling down in concentration, has one point that where he says that before you focus on the breath, You can contemplate the three perceptions. You can contemplate the body. All kinds of things to get the mind in the right mood. The right mood is one that's sober, but joyful. Now you may say, well, I came to the meditation because I want the meditation to make me joyful. But there are ways you can bring joy to the meditation. In fact, the Buddha talks about how once there's a feeling of joy, that grows into rapture, the rapture goes into calm, the calm grows into concentration, right in line with the lineup in the factors for awakening. So what comes before joy and rapture? Some right effort. The Buddha talks about some of the conditions that can give rise to that kind of joy. And they basically come down to two things. The factors that he said are the most useful for gaining awakening. The internal factor, which is appropriate attention, and the external factor, which is admirable friendship. For the internal factor, you look at what's going on in your mind, and you see that there are unskillful things going on there. And you don't give in to them. You're able to pull yourself out a little bit and remind yourself, this is an unskillful habit here. And because it's unskillful, I don't have to do it. The mind may give you all kinds of reasons why you've got to think in those ways. You've been thinking in those ways for who knows how long, and that's the way your mind is. But one of the Buddha's most important discoveries is that the mind doesn't have to stick to its old habits. We have this element of free choice here in the present moment. We can say, okay, I'm going to give that up. It may not be forever, but I'm going to give it up for now. This can apply to the hindrances or to call the upigilesas, things like greed, anger, antagonism, dismissiveness, stubbornness, deceit, intoxication, heed heedlessness. If you can identify any of these traits in your mind and say, for the time being, I'm just going to drop that. I'm not going to go there. And you see that you can't drop it. I remember one time overhearing John Foon teaching some lay people. He'd have them meditate, and he'd actually engage them in conversation sometimes. He could see what was going on in their minds. I was listening from the next room, and I kept hearing him say to this one woman, Drop it. And she said, I can't. He said, Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. And so she dropped it. The next thing I knew, she was bowing down to him. I'd really like to know what it was that she was dropping. But one of our biggest enemies is our attitude, I can't drop this. It's such a deeply ingrained habit I've got.
But you don't have to drop it forever. Drop it right now. Because if you believe that you can't drop it until you've rooted it out, you're never going to get to the root. Remind yourself it's good if you can just cut it off at ground level. You may sprout again. At least for the time being, your mind will be free from that weed. And then you can enjoy the fact that it's gone. It may try to come back and say, no, I don't need you. And that can give rise to a sense of joy. From the joy comes rapture. And then calm concentration. That's a case where appropriate attention can give rise to a sense of joy, and from that joy it leads naturally to getting the mind to settle down. Then there's admirable friendship. The Buddha talks about have, living in a community where people are harmonious. They get along. They treat one another with affection. As he says, they mix together as well as milk and water. In a community like that, it's easy to feel a sense of joy. We're working on something together. Our values are together. Our precepts are together. And that can give rise to the joy that would then allow the mind to settle down. In other places, he goes more into specifics. You get to discuss the Dharma. You get to listen to the Dharma. And again, listening to the Dharma is like that exchange between John Fung and that woman. The Buddha talks about qualities you can develop. You can be mindful. And you look at your mind and say, oh yeah, there's mindfulness. You can be alert. Yeah, there's alertness. You can be ardent. Yes, I'm trying hard. Okay, you've got what you need. And you work on those three things. And as you work on them, there's, there's a sense of joy that comes. That the Dharma is pointing right at your mind. It's not pointing you far away. Even when the Buddha is talking about karma and the way it plays itself over huge cycles of time, he ends this discussion by saying, all these events come from karma. And where is karma? It's right here, right now. The choices you're making are right here, right now. So even something as big as that comes back to what you're doing right now. And so you do it. You do it right. You don't make it difficult for yourself. You don't put up obstacles. You're willing to go along with the Dharma. And you start seeing results. And the results give rise to joy, from joy there's rapture, and so on down the line. This, by the way, explains why some people can gain awakening while they're listening to the Dharma. And we know from the analysis that you've got to have all eight factors of the path for there to be awakening. Some people say, well, how can you have right concentration when you're listening to the Dharma? Well, it's just precisely in this way. You listen to the Dharma in a way that you see how it applies to you. You're applying appropriate attention at the same time that you're enjoying the fruits of having admirable friendship. You're seeing how the Dharma applies to what you're doing. As the Buddha said, the ideal state of mind to bring to a Dharma talk is that you're confident. You don't look down on the Dharma, you don't look down on the speaker, you don't look down on yourself. You're confident that you can do this. Then you gather your mind right there and apply appropriate attention. When the Dharma talk says to abandon unskillful qualities, you say, do I have anything unskillful in here? Yes. Well, you can abandon it. Just drop it. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't make it hard.
And you can see that the mind is a lot more refreshed and open without that unskillful quality. When the talk mentions developing skillful qualities, okay, you work on those, and you begin to see that they're giving results. That too can give rise to joy. And then as the mind settles down, you get into concentration, that multiplies the joy. deepens the concentration, makes it more and more the kind of concentration that's appropriate for going deeper into the mind, developing the discernment that can go deeper. Which is why some people are able to gain awakening while they listen to a Dharma talk. So remember, the Buddha didn't just teach a technique. And he never said, well, just do the technique and that'll take care of everything. I don't know how many times I hear people saying, well, just do this mindfulness technique or do this noting technique or whatever. Just bring non-reactive awareness to everything in life and you'll be okay. Well, it doesn't work that way. they are concentration techniques, but they are also ways of thinking, ways of evaluating what's going on in your mind. There's a whole teaching on karma, which the cause of principle of karma is not just causes coming in from the past, but also, and more importantly, the decisions you're making right now. If you really believe in that, you can make use of it. And as you make use of it, you see the results right here, right now. So remember these principles. This is how you get the mind into concentration, not just doing the technique, but having the right values, having the right assumptions. Taking advantage of admirable friendship, trying to be an admirable friend, creating an atmosphere of harmony, in which people can discuss the Dharma and feel a sense of joy from the discussion. And then they can take the Dharma and then use it to chip, chip, chip away at each instance of an unskillful state coming up in the mind. And then appreciating that. The more you appreciate the, the value of just saying no to something unskillful and saying yes and working with something skillful, the more you appreciate that, the greater the rewards are going to be. So use these principles to bring the right attitude to the meditation. The meditation will develop, and it will deepen your conviction in the right attitudes. So both the values and the technique will grow together.